Do you want to learn how you can get 50% of your voicemails returned the very next morning? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man podcast. On today's show, we have Thibaut Shanto. He is a world-leading sales expert. He is the principal over at Renbo Sales Solutions. You can find out more about Tibor over at tiborshanto.com. And on today's episode, we're diving into voicemails. Tibor shares very practically the 15 second voicemail that we should all be leaving, how we should be answering these calls and turning essentially a return voicemail into a sales conversation and a whole lot more. So with all that said, let's jump in to today's episode. Tibor, welcome back to the Salesman Podcast. Always great to be back. Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome, sir. I'm glad to have you on. You know this anytime. Today, we're going to cover a topic of conversation that I don't think we've covered directly on the show before. So I know there's going to be loads of value in this one, and that is voicemails. So I'm going to start off with a, I think I know where you'll go with this, but I'll, I'll ask it you just to tee it up. Super basic question. When we're prospecting for new business, should we always leave a voicemail or are we leaving it strategically? And then we'll dive into the contents of the voicemail later on. So I think you should always leave voicemail and I think you should always be strategic about it. I'll, I'll qualify it in one small way that sometimes I'll call somebody two or three times in a day and Two of those might be stealth, meaning, you know, I block my number, whether I do it on my mobile. So I don't want them to know that I'm stalking them. And, you know, there's no other word. But that's what we do for a living, right? Um, but on the on, on the call, let's say I called the individual three times that day. Two are stealth. On the call where my number does show up, yes, leave a voicemail. And if you're not calling stealth, if you don't have the ability to block your number, then yes, leave a voicemail. So an unqualified yes with an exclamation mark. So you just you just broke the the borders of the conversation here already. Um, I'll take it one direction. We'll come back to the contents of the voicemail in a second. But I know in the UK you can dial a number, and I can't remember the number you dial in front of it, and you can block your number from an outgoing call, whether your company allows you to, whether the software that allows you to, or however it's arranged. So I don't know about in the US and Canada whether you can do that as well. Starts at seven in North America. Perfect. So if we can do this, what is the cadence of stalkery conversations or not conversations, stalkery calls throughout the day versus voicemails and letting them know that we're trying to get in touch with them? Is it is it a one to two ratio that we should be aiming for? Um, yeah, I think one or two. It, it comes down to, to the question of how how badly you want to speak to the individual. So let's say you've read some information, you've done business with a competitor, there's really a good fit, you know, from, from the information that you have. And you also maybe have gotten the tip through various things, and maybe this is decision time. So maybe you know that every year, from my perspective, they have an annual meeting in January, and they begin to plan the people who are going to appear there and so forth. So clearly that person's high on my priority list. So with them, I might do, you know, two or three stealth calls a day, and then, you know, one visible. Um, and again, um, if somebody was, let's say, it's hard to say this, but let's be practical. If someone's a lesser priority at the moment, then I may only do one or two, because again, the most important thing or the most valuable thing that we have as salespeople is our time. So I wanna make sure that I'm investing the time in those things that are going to pay the largest rewards. So you've hit the nail on its head here. This is one of the questions I wanted to ask was along the lines of how do we prioritize the amount of time that we're spending on the phone, you know, forgetting voicemail all of a sudden. And you've kind of summed it up there because what I wanted to ask you was, should we be getting up at nine o'clock every or getting to the office at nine o'clock every morning and making 10 calls throughout the day on the hour to each of these people? Or should we be being strategic around it? And I think you've answered it there, but is, the, is, the, is it useful to have habits when you're leaving calls when you're making calls, leaving voicemails, is that the way we should be thinking about this of we have a structure and a routine and a cadence that we work against? Absolutely. So, um, yes, it should be a habit. I mean, 40 percent of what human beings do is habit. So the question is whether it's a good habit or a bad habit. So when I used to smoke, it was a bad habit, but I did it. Right. So I think, yes, you do need to make it a habit. You know, and again, let's bring in the obvious analogy, sports, like you go through the same practice, the game on the weekend may unfold differently, but our, our, our thing is to have a process with which we can deal with the various things that come at us. So yes, you should have a, you should have a habit around voicemail. You should have a habit around cadence. So what are the other elements or other types of touch points that you can, um, that you can 
bring with the person. And then again, prioritizing because I'm going to be more dogged in my pursuit for somebody that I think, again, is clearly within my box versus somebody just to the side and so on. And again, I'm not qualifying them from a, one being good, one being bad, but just from an opportunity perspective. I do want to comment on something that you said. If you're getting to the office at nine and making your calls, forget it because <laughs> somebody else is beating you to it. So I think you should maybe make those calls before you leave the house and get to the office. I used to work for a manager. He had a great, uh, a great saying, and it was eight by eight and five after five. So the idea was call eight people before 8 a.m. and call five others after five. So if you're getting there at nine and picking up the phone, don't bother. And, and why is that? Is this strategically that they've, the person that you're calling has probably just got to the office. They've not opened their email. They've not been swamped by 15 admin requests by other people. Is that why we want to call them uh, kind of before or eight and, and five? Yeah, I think you want to, you know, again, look at, I tend to go after more senior people, you know, hierarchically, not in any other way. But, um, you know, so they tend to get to the office a little bit early. I know when I was on the other side of the table in corporate America, I was at the office by 730 thinking I've got a window of, you know, quietness for an hour, whereas you say I'm not getting those things and so on. So if I can call at that time of day and the person answers the phone because it's still quiet, they know it's not going to be one of their salespeople because they get to the office at nine. So it's not going to be before that. So there's a greater likelihood that they'll answer the phone. Um, in fact, bringing it back to voicemail, as we should, one of the techniques that I think people should do once they adopt my voicemail technique, which I learned a long time ago, is let's say I know I'm going to be in the office this morning, right? Or let's say tomorrow morning. Then what I might do is really late at night, meaning about 7, 7.30, leave 15 voicemails for different people. And as we get through the voicemail technique, which I'm sure we'll touch on, my voicemails are roughly about 15 seconds. So leaving 15 voicemails, you could do that in a commercial break in your favorite you know, hockey game or football game in your case. Um, you know, so you could do it in a relatively easy period. The idea is that because you're coming in late in the day, they probably cleared their voicemail when they left. So when you come in in the morning, you're going to be one of the first messages. And if that message tickles something in the back of their mind, they'll call you back. So I do that because I'm lazy. So, you know, if they call me back in the morning, let's say half of them call me back. I'm cocky enough to believe that one of those I'll convert into an appointment and then boom, you know, my day is done from the hard part. Now I can go on to the fun part, which is the selling. I know from, and doubling down on this idea of calling early in medical devices, I would call from about seven till eight because all the surgeons would be starting the shift at nine. Uh, officially, unofficially, they'd be there from about quarter past eight, uh, doing the ward rounds, getting on top of everything procedurally. And so that period before that, I don't know about in the US, but here in the UK, the surgeons don't typically live nearby the hospital. They don't want to essentially be around potential patients or people that they've uh, worked with professionally. And so they tend to live half an hour, an hour away. And this is only this is only fluke and trial and error that I uncovered all of this. But I would start calling at seven and I'd catch them on the drive into work where they'd be happy to speak to me because they're only listening to the radio or, or chill out, chilling out and, and thinking about the work day ahead of them anyway. So I used to call at that point. And this was a surgeon over here in Bradford who demanded that I would speak to him at seven o'clock whenever I wanted him. And I wouldn't email him because the emails would just get lost. And he's, he used to hate his assistant that the NHS had provided for him. And she, in, in, in her, I, I, I can't repeat the words that he used to describe her, but she wasn't, she wasn't worth the kind of time and effort that he would give to her. So he would ask that I just, if I ever wanted anything from him, I'd call him at seven o'clock. We'd have the conversation. Then I could come in physically later in the day and provide the equipment or do the training or whatever it was. So just to double down on that. Okay. So other touch points. We'll come on to that towards the end of the show. If we're not getting any response, what do we do? Before that, you've teed it up here now, Tibor. You've got us all excited. 15-second voicemail message. What What are we saying and what are we trying to, what's the response we're trying to get back from it? So I think uh, I have a post somewhere on my blog um, where I compare voicemails to bikinis. And uh, I heard somebody once make a great analogy about a financial statement. And they said they're a lot like bikinis. What's more interesting is not what they reveal, but what they're hiding. So, um, you know, if you think about voicemail, most people are trying to give that killer voicemail that will capture the imagination. I come at it from the other way, which is how can I give just enough information that it hides the relevant things 
And to get the relevant things, they have to phone me. So it's a bit of a tease, and I don't apologize for it. Um, I think before I give you the technique, I think it's important to set it up. And, and later on, we can share a, a YouTube uh, channel where they can go and see some of this. But you have to ask yourself, you know, in, in the course of a day, we're, we're calling people who have more than a full day, right? Like every time somebody gets laid off, the work doesn't go away, the people get left behind. So most of them get in a zone and they're like trying to pack that 16 hours into a 10 hour day, right? So if you think about voicemail, it, it has to, in a sense, tweak their curiosity. If it fits into the mold that they've pre-planned for the day, it's gonna end up being seven, six or whatever it is that people used to delete. Um, the other is most salespeople want to leave a voicemail that's very much like the message that they would deliver if the individual had actually picked up the phone. But the person listening to your voicemail doesn't really care that it's live or Memorex. They're not differentiating that you're there in the room or not. They're listening to what you have to say. And if you say all the things that you would say in the introduction, what you inevitably do is invite an objection. And since you're not there to take that objection away, you're basically losing, right? Because you're fighting forces. You're not there to fight the forces that you're up against. So, you know, in a regular call, you can say things. You anticipate that they're going to give you an objection. They give you one of the five common ones, and you deal with it, and you keep going through that. So in mentally, they go through the same process. I call up, and I say, I've got the greatest co you know, copier since sliced bread. It's shiny. It's fast. It's this, that, and the other. And they look around, and they go, we got a copier. Boom. I suffer the fate of we're all set. But if I was on the phone and he said he was all set, I could work with it. So I've got to avoid them actually making up <clears throat> making up their minds. So I, I, again, my voicemail is very cryptic. It's based on the technique that the human mind hates a mystery, right? And everything we do in sales has to have a purpose, right? It's not just going out there. It's not a question of working harder, as you know, right? So if you think about voicemail, the only victory in voicemail is getting a call back. What most people try and do through voicemail is either sell or get an appointment. Well, it doesn't work like that, right? So if you go for that, you're going to lose. And we've all had people who've left us these long voicemails and they don't get to the point. So what I want is I want that person to want to call me back at the end. So the only thing I have to worry about is getting a call back. I don't worry about getting the appointment or the sale or anything like that. There's a singular purpose. Let's get that call back. So we talked about the human mind hating a mystery. The, the analogy I always use is, you know, when you're at a party and you're talking to a friend and you're talking about a movie or a rock and roll band and you just can't remember who the guy was that played the bass, right? And it just begins to eat away at you, you know, and a couple of, my, you know, sort of nachos later and a beer <laughs> later, you remember the guy's name and you go, Eureka, and you have this like moment of catharsis, right? Now you can really enjoy the party. So that's what I'm going for in a voicemail. I want to give that person enough of a mystery, create a bit of a curiosity that they will want to solve that mystery and curiosity. And the only way to do that is to call back the digits that I leave in my voicemail. So that's what I'm going for here. So it's not going to feel comfortable for a lot of people. It's somewhat cryptic. And I'll deal with the most common objection or pushback I get once I share the technique. So the technique is really simple. And as I promised, if you go to youtube.com slash sell better, there's a whole section on, uh, on, on voicemail. But I start by giving them my name and my company name. So I'll say, my name's Shanto. I'm calling you from Renbor. The reason I don't say Tibor is that Tibor from Renbor is just a little too poetic. So, you know, I say, my name's Shanto. I'm calling you from Renbor. Then I give them my phone number, but I do two things very specifically. One is I slow down. We've all had the guy who thinks he's a NASCAR driver, you know? My number is blah, 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 blah. Well, how are you supposed to pick up on that, right? So I tell people to visualize they themselves writing their own number as they're giving it into the phone. So that'll force them to give it at a pace that the person at the other end of the phone can actually take it down. And people will continue to take down data as long as they haven't made up their minds. So that's why I give the number right after I give my name and company name. And by the way, the other going back to the name, think about what the, like my name, unfortunately, the name of my company is Renboy Sales Solutions. So if I was to leave that full name, they'd think, uh-oh, big and there's an invoice in there somewhere so that's why i just say red more so the other thing when it comes to the phone number is don't say please call me back at your earliest convenience literally nothing smells more like a salesperson than those set of words in a voicemail please call me back at your earliest convenience says call me when you're ready to send me money that's what they're hearing 
So I say something authoritative and, and I tell people to, you know, feel important and say, you know, I can be reached at or you can call me back at and say it with some degree of authority. So a person feels like they have to call you back. Right. Don't say it like you're a Gestapo guy, but, you know, like say it with some authority. I always tell people, pretend you're from the tax service. Right. You know, you got to call me back because I'm from Revenue Canada or whatever they call it in the UK. Right. So, and then the last thing that I leave, and this is the important thing, and this is the one, the, the piece that everybody feels uncomfortable about, is I leave the name of a company that I've done business with that they compete with. Now, if your first day on the job, you're going to have to borrow somebody else within your company. But fortunately, over the last 14 years, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of companies. So most sectors that I want to work in, I probably have a good referral link. So to summarize before I take on the objections... Um, so if I was calling you, Will, I would say, hi, Will, my name is Tibor Shanto, calling you from Renbor. I can be reached at 416-822-7781. By the way, when you call, please reference the other podcast. And But I'll give a particular name. So I've had the good fortune of doing business with Imperial Oil in Canada. So if I was to call Shell and Prospect, I would leave Imperial Oil as the reference. And then hang up. And that's the hard part for a lot of people is the hanging up because they feel that such a short message. So people don't like the fact that I leave this third party reference. They, they think that I'm baiting somebody and so on. But I say, and, and, and I don't say it with any amount of humor, that if you think about it, it's a short form resume, right? So if you think about a resume, what do you put on your resume? You certainly put your name at the top and how they can contact you, right? And then you give a series of companies that you worked for. Because you're hoping that one of those companies will validate that they should actually call you in for an interview. So I'm doing that in a Twitter world, you know, 140 characters. So who I am, where I'm calling from, where they can reach me. And here's what I want to talk to you about. And I'm not lying because if Shell was to call me back, I would refer to the success and experience that I had with the other company, right? So to me, the idea is to create a bit of a mystery and then have them call you back. Want to hear some of the other objections I get? Or I am trying my best not to say anything and just let you go off in here. But I've, I'll, I'll interrupt, I'll interject at this point, T Bob, because I've got a ton of questions for you. One, I don't think the audience should be being bothered because you, you seem to be trying to justify a lot of this. In that, I don't think what you've said is weird and manipulative. And there's other people that have come on the show. Um, there's there's Grant Cardone, who's classic, and his sales guys for going what you've done there and then going one step beyond of I can do X, Y, Z and then hanging up and then using weird manipulation tactics like that, pretending the phone's gone dead and things like this. I think all that's a little bit weird. I think everything you've said makes total sense. And I don't think from my side and the audience side, there's anything to deliberate on here, but there's a couple of things that I do want to ask about. Um, one, are we always going for that call back? We're not giving them an option to email us. We're not giving them an option to text us. Is it always the phone call that we're after here? Yeah, it's the phone call you're after. The hesitation with email on the first shot. And again, I don't want to call it hesitation because I think email has to be part of the pursuit mix or the cadence, as you call it. Um, but I look at my own habits and I try and sort of study the person, right? Not the prospect, as it were. And as soon as somebody sends me an email or gives me exposure to their email, I grab everything after the at sign and drop it into a browser and see what they're all about. And since I want to be in a position to create that first impression... Um, my preference, and I'm not saying it's right, my preference is to start with a phone call and give them the option of calling me back. Email doesn't go away. It's not like I can't send them an email. And sometimes I'll send it later that day. Sometimes I'll send it the following morning. But, um, you know, that's the, in the first shot on the phone, that's what I give them the option to do. And then, so I'm, I'm just going to go through these. I've got a big list of them here. So are we... Are we proactively avoiding sounding like a salesperson? Because uh, that could get a little bit weird if we're almost lying about who, why we're calling them. Or are we, are we treating salespeople and ourselves like we should be, like we are professionals, like we're there to help them, that we are more senior than just someone who sat there cold calling, dialing all day? Are we, what I'm trying to get at here is, are we, if we're trying to avoid being like a salesperson, is that because there's a negative stereotype of salespeople, which we are not? The, the podcast here, the B2B audience, aren't those individuals that represent that used car salesperson? 
or are we going that one step beyond and kind of like pushing the limits here, if that makes sense? I don't think we're trying to avoid sounding like a salesperson. I mean, I think part of that comes down to how you see yourself as a salesperson. I, you know, you and I have talked about this. I think salespeople are subject matter experts, right? So any VP of sales that I that I sell to probably knows more about selling from their company's perspective. But just the exposure I've had, I know more about sales than they do. I'm not saying I'm smarter, better, cleaner, or shinier. I just have been exposed to more, and therefore I'm a conduit to best practices. So. I see that that's what I'm bringing to the table. So it has, for me, it's not that I'm trying to hide that I'm a salesperson or not. I'm looking to see what, I need to engage with this person because until then nothing matters, right? So what I'm looking for is how can I get this person to call me back so I can create that engagement, right? And what I'm doing here, and and, and what you alluded to in the middle is what blows up and what people generally ex- object to is they feel that I'm lying to the person and I don't feel that I am. My name is Tibor. I work for Rembor. 416 is my number. And I've done business with the company that I'm referencing. So I may be giving you a lack of information, which is intentional, because I want you to come to me to get those pieces in in the thing. But I'm not misleading or lying to them. When they call me, I'm going to talk exactly about what I told them to refer. Got it. Got it. It makes total sense. And when they call back, one of the things that People ask me is, well, what happens if they ask me why you left X, Y, Z or whatever? And I say that they should look at that as an easy intro into what they want to talk about. And they'll say, you know, well, you know, Imperial Oil is one of the companies that I've dealt with. And I get into right into my introduction and away we go. So and I tell them, you know, I call so many different people and the number you call me back on is my mobile. It's the way that I understand which of my segments you fall into. How how do you manage, Tibor? How do you manage these callbacks from a practical standpoint of, because uh, if we're calling you mobile and you get a call back, it may or may not be on the same number that they uh, you cut, that you've got for them. So you might have called their mobile, they might call you back on their office. So that makes it difficult for you, for example, to put the number that you've called them on in your phone so you know who's calling you. So clearly you answer, hey, Tibor, Rembo, uh, Sales Solutions. How do you then transition that from, how, how how do you ask, hey, did I leave you a voicemail? You know, if you're making lots of these calls a day, if that makes sense. So, you know, I've talked a few times. So, you know, sometimes I think salespeople just make too much of nothing. Um, you know, like if I'm in my car, first of all, the number comes up on my dashboard, right? So if I recognize it, great. Do I remember all the people I called in the last three, four days? No. But the reality is I recognize all the numbers that are important to me, right? So I know sure. it's not my wife, it's not my kids, it's not this, it's not my broker, da 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 So now a voice comes on and he goes, ask for Tibor. I go, yes, speaking. And they go, hi, it's George so-and-so from such a company, you left me a message, right? That's generally how it goes. Sure. Now, even if I don't recognize the company, which is fa- probably the case most of the time, why did I leave anybody a voicemail whose voice or name I don't recognize? Clearly to get an appointment. So I just go into appointment mode. I go, thanks for calling back. I caught the name of the company that they said. So if they said Rico and they're a copier company, I'll go, by the way, in addition to Rico, I've also dealt with Icon, Pitney Bowes, blah, blah, blah. And I go into the thing. So I think salespeople make this too much of a big deal. And I think, again, if they borrowed a bit from their favorite sports, you know, like I don't think that, football players look for perfection. They look to execute their playbook. And if you study your playbook and you have it down pat, all these things fall into place. But I don't get fussed. And and I get this question a lot, and it's probably the only one I don't get. Like, you know, you're a salesperson. Somebody calls you. Go into sales mode. You don't know the (laughs) phone. Chances are you got to prospect them. So go into prospecting mode. If it's a voice you know but hasn't spoken in six months, go into that mode. I mean, this to me is the easiest thing. If you're a hockey player and somebody passes you the puck, figure out what to do with it, dude. Like, you know, you've been doing it for a while. Sure. I guess we're all fearful of the unknown. I guess where that's that comes from. But what I like here is whether you've intentionally or unintentionally, you've given us a process here of if we leave a voicemail and we mention a competitor – and we know the vertical, the industry. So when they call us and they say they're from XYZ and we can name another competitor that we worked with, we've immediately in a conversation, uh, a conversation, we've had that transition from awkward, hey, who are you, to prospecting conversation immediately. And I think that's, have you, have you meant to engineer that into the, the conversation there as, as a kind of tip and a process? I think that's really useful for the audience to get as past the moment of unknown and into, hey, I've worked with one of your competitors or, X 
kind of product or uh, X individual in the industry, how can I help you? Is the perhaps the next line that we can dive into from that? Well, as you know, from previous things, I'll take it to objectives that I've helped them achieve. So it's, you know, the same thing, but you're right. You talk about outcomes that, that you feel they would directly benefit from. But I just find that to me, like, dude, you're a sales guy, you know, like sell, you know, like, I don't know what the issue is. Well, I can, I can tell you from my perspective, it's just when I first started medical device sales, it was time. It was just time and having enough of these conversations before you've got the the automatic responses and almost the habits on the phone to go back with this. And I know a lot of the audience are new to sales. A lot of the audience are super tenured. A good chunk of the audience are moving from one vertical to another. Perhaps they're moving from SDR to AE. So in answer to kind of how you're describing that, I guess some of it is just experience. You're a killer salesperson, Tibo. You've been doing it forever. It probably just comes natural to you. And uh, that, that's what I wanted to just digest a little bit further. And I think mean, that that almost a tactic there of, going back and forth with competitors or because you build a rapport within that moment as well, right? You're building a similarity before you dive into any further down the, the sales funnel and the conversation. So with that, you mentioned a number early on and you said, I, I don't know whether you just kind of flippantly put it out there, but you mentioned about 50% of people call you back. What should, what number, clearly you're, you're a recognized expert in the space. So that's not going to be the same for the audience perhaps, but what number of returned voicemails means that we're doing the right things and putting the right steps into place. So there's two ways to measure that. I think there's the way you're asking. And I would say I get anywhere from about on a broad range, 30 to 50% of messages that I leave, I get a call back within about 72 hours, right? So that's not bad. Usually track somewhere around 40%, but I've had some slow days, some better days. So I think that's the sort of numerical answer to your question. But I would say if even if you diminish your expectations to zero callbacks, voicemail still has a purpose because it's a touch point, right? It's one of those in, in what you call the cadence, I call the pursuit, but it's going to take a lot of touch points. Depending who you listen to, it takes anywhere from eight to I've heard as high as 15, but the low end is what counts. And so even if you don't get a call back, um, it's one of those eight touch points that you're going to have with that that prospect before they ever even decide to, re- to to just call you back or to respond. And nobody guarantees that the response is going to be positive. It's just going to be a response, right? So I think even if we diminish expectations to zero, which I don't think you should, you're still serving a purpose by leaving a voicemail. Okay. Sam, the salesperson, listening to the show in the car on the way to work, he is going to call at seven o'clock because... He's driving at half six in the morning for some reason. He's going to call at lunchtime, try and catch the individual while they're grabbing their lunch. And then he's going to leave a voicemail as he's watching Pinky in the Brain at seven o'clock this evening. And hopefully that's going to get picked up in the morning. Unfortunately, he doesn't get a response. What's the next step? Is it more calls, voicemails? Is it a touch point from a different angle? Is it, and I, I think you know as kind of as well, the audience do, I hate the term, but... Do we start social selling them at this point? How do we how do we get more touch points and I guess build more rapport uh, kind of with this one way conversation that we're having so that they actually want to uh, converse and engage engage with us? So some of these things are in sequence and some of these things are simultaneous. So I think the notion of do we start social selling? I think that's part of the mix from the beginning, right? So as I'm as I'm trying to find out what Will's all about, I probably check out your LinkedIn page. In which case, you know, I've been on the page, so the social sale part has begun, right? It's, you know, I'm there, right? Whether you're paying attention or not. Um, I think people have choices. I'll give you a couple of different examples, but you know, in my world, for instance, first of all, in Canada, we have very strong anti-spam legislation. So there are certain people that I cannot email to, even if I wanted to, like, you know, some people it's frustrating, but you know, you have to get either more creative or more persistent. But let's assume we're in the States where you can lead with emails, right? You know, so if I was to start with the phone, which I would just probably due to my age and style as opposed to anything else. But if I was more active and maybe closer to my 30s and 40s, I'd probably start with email. So hey, and and just on that, Tibor, if I was getting a 40 percent response rate to voicemails, I'd be calling the heck out of people as well. So I don't I don't necessarily think it's it's age. Perhaps it's your style. But if I could get a response rate like that and have people, you know, spend an evening just calling people and have incoming calls to me the next morning, I'd be, I'd be all in on it for sure. Right. And again, remember that you have to do this over time because they'll call you back within three, four days, but yeah, you can build up 
enough of a what do you want. And I don't know what it is, and perhaps it's a different topic altogether, and you'll need to get a psychiatrist on or something. But I do slightly better with callbacks than I do with people that pick up the phone because I have this cocky attitude. Like, I got you to call back, now you're mine, right? So I just have this slightly tinge of more confidence in those calls, right? Um, but to your point, so let's say I leave somebody a voicemail on Monday morning, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock time frame. Um, I might call them back stealth the following day. Um, then I'll call them again openly on Wednesday morning. And the voicemail wouldn't be that different. I'll say, well, it's Tibor. I'm following through on my voicemail from earlier in the week. You'll recall that you can reach me at, and I'll leave my number again. And as I mentioned, please reference XYZ company. So we're not giving them any more information. We're reiterating it. We're being friendly and so on. Um, you know, but now that's that second touch point. So if I'm in an email country, then that afternoon I might send them an email. And the email, again, wouldn't give much more than that. Well, I'm following up to my voicemail, da 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 and I'll say something to the fact that I'm sorry we've missed each other. Listen, I'm going to give you a call tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Now, the expectation, I don't have the expectation that they're going to pick up the phone at 9 o'clock. But it is a subtle way for us in sales who have a bad reputation for not following through to actually follow through. So make that call back at a time that you know you can make it and it's not going to interfere with your day. But, you know, I tell them I'll call you back tomorrow at nine. So if I call a minute either side of nine, I look good because I did what I said I was going to do. And I'm not disappointed that they didn't call, like they didn't pick up the phone. Um, I probably would have looked at their LinkedIn profile by now. So that's another way to get on their radar. Um, Thursday afternoon, I would probably put a snail mail. Um, I use a card service where they've scanned in my handwriting. And, you know, so I send that out with the goal that that probably will land the following Tuesday. So here we have, what, four touch points plus a fifth one in play. And so we give them the weekend off for good behavior. Um, and then, you know, Monday I might openly invite them to connect on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Wednesday, if I have their mobile number, text is part of the mix as well. So, you know, I might follow up with a text. Um, and then on the Friday, the last Friday, I might leave them a, a voicemail that says, you know, Will, I'm sorry I've missed you. I'm still interested in talking to you. Clearly, you're preoccupied. I'll follow up in the next little while. However, if you're inclined, I'm at 416, da 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 So there's eight or nine touch points right there, and I don't think I'm risking an injunction order. So two things here, Tibor, um, and they might kind of fall into the, the same answer. Are we always sending emails and if we perhaps change your voicemail slightly as well that say, I will call you at nine o'clock on XYZ day versus an open question of when can I, when's convenient to give you a call? And then following up from that, is there always an end point to the, the cycle of processing or can we go on for years leaving voicemails for the same person? So to answer the first question, if I remember it, um, I always end with a call to action. So even if I, uh, I don't like to leave it open-ended unless I know the person, but we're assuming here we're prospecting somebody we haven't spoken to. So I don't like to leave it open-ended. So I, I might say, you know, Will, are you available Thursday morning at 9.30? And then at times, and don't ask me why, it really comes down to the direction of the wind. I might say, if that doesn't work, you know, here's a link to my calendar and, you, you know, I'll give them a calendarly link. But nine times out of 10, I'll say, if that doesn't work, please suggest an alternative, right? Um, but always end with a call to action. Um, what was the second part? And then, so the second part, and I think this might follow on of, is is there a hard stop after two weeks or so? And, and do you leave it open-ended then? Or do you say, I won't contact you for X many months and I'll contact you kind of beginning of next quarter or whatever the kind of next. I don't tell them X many months. Um, I tell them that I, you know, I'll follow up with you, you know, I'll follow up again. Now it's up to you what that follow up time frame is. But to the other part of the question, for me, and I know somebody that does it differently, so I'll speak for what I do. But um, for me, the end point is about two weeks. And I don't look at it as giving up. I look at it that I need stuff in the pipeline. And if it's going to take me five, six weeks to get this person in the pipeline, what happens in the in that period of time? So that's why my last call to them is say, you can always reach me at this number, but I'll follow through in the future. So I think, you know, leads are more recyclable than time. So, 
you know, I, I can't get back the time. So, you know, I know somebody that continues, 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 but they pursue like really big ticket items. So it, it's a little bit different. But I think that you should introduce new leads into the mix because you need opportunities in your pipeline. And even though you might get this one, if you get it in November, it's not going to close till next year, which means it does you no good at the moment. I think what you just said then was really powerful, Tibor, of I wrote it down, leads are more recyclable than time. Is this a problem that you see, and we'll wrap up with this, is this the problem you see with sales reps that B2B salespeople, that they are too precious about their leads, that they have somewhat of a scarcity mindset about how they can gather new leads, about the prospecting, that they put too much stock into them when there's loads more business out there if we just make the effort to go and prospect for it? I think, yeah, definitely it's that. I think that, you know, people um, get obsessed with leads. I think to some degree, and I, I put myself at the front of the line, you know, salespeople have a herder mentality, right? So like if somebody leaves, the next guy wants his territory, right? Even though they're not touching anybody in their territory with any sufficient degree. So I think that, you know, there is this, as you say, scarcity herder mentality and, and so on. I think more... The, the bigger problem, if they focused on that, it would probably have much wider benefit to their selling as a whole, is how they view their time. I think they they see time as having an endless supply. And I think, yeah, on the one hand, you can argue there's an endless supply, but this hour is going to end within the next 60 minutes and you ain't getting it back. I think time is the, and this is a product idea I've had for months now that I might investigate further, in, further down the line. But I think time is, I don't think, I know time is only unrenewable resource that we have as as meat sacks walking around with kind of 80 to 100 years if we're if we're healthy and so i really encourage the audience to think about that themselves and drill down into it of what can you do to accelerate your sales process everything else just so you can buy yourself more time out the other end of it how you can leverage all of this to retire early and that's your motivation for for me anyway of if i get better at selling if i can close bigger deals more frequently and have a process, it doesn't mean necessarily more money. It doesn't mean a yacht. What it means is I get to retire 20 years earlier and make the most of the time, which is the only thing that we have that we can't buy back. We, we, that's probably the best way to describe it. It's the only thing on the planet that we can't buy with more resources. You can win the lottery and you're still, you know, perhaps you can work on your health. Perhaps you can work on your diet. Other than that, and you know, if you're in the, over here in the UK, we have the NHS, which is amazing, but perhaps you can get better healthcare elsewhere. But other than that, you're screwed. That's the only thing that you can't buy back. So just to kind of diverge and go off topic there, T-Ball, for a second, but I think that's really important for, as I ponder on it constantly at the moment, I think it's important for the, the audience, hopefully, to, to ponder on as well. And with that, mate, I've got one final question. I've asked you before, and I'm going to ask you again, and that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I still tell the pull sword to run the other way, but um, I think that's what I told you the first time, right? <laughs> Myself on the other way. Um, I think you know it's. I think it's it's sort of an extension of what you, what you were saying, which is that you know nothing's going to happen overnight, and you got to balance that pull of wanting to do something versus the time that you're not going to get back if it doesn't work out. Now, I wanna be clear, you know, I want people to, to experiment, I want them to take shots and so on, but at the end of the day, as salespeople, we need to deliver against quota. So I think what people need to do is work backwards from their quota and, and understand what their time is. So I think that I would talk to my younger self and say, look at time as a bit more important. You know, when we're young, we sort of don't think about time. So I think that I would be telling myself to look at time as, 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 as a uh, valuable commodity. Good stuff. Well, with that, tell us about the new website and tell us about the, we're talking about prospecting here, tell us about the prospecting course on there as well. So the new website coming soon to a browser near you, uh, real easy, tiborshanto.com. Um, decided to sort of go out there with my own name for a change. Um, I think it should be live within the next week or two. Um, and... In terms of the course, the Proactive Prospecting course is available now online at uh, Sales Baby University, and it will certainly be part of the new site, tiborshanto.com, in case I didn't mention it. Um, and there'll be a lot of things on that that enhance the course, 
and uh, we'll be offering a number of different things around the proactive prospecting course. And in fact, one of the things that will be there again in a couple of weeks, so hold off, um, is a um, the the, uh, the voicemail component of, of the program. So people will be able to put the voicemail into practice. Um, so a couple of weeks, tiborshanto.com. But in the meantime, sellbetter.ca works too. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes to this episode over at salesmanpodcast.com. And with that, Tibor, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for making this super practical. Of, I'm hopeful that the audience can now, if they are leaving voicemails, can go and experiment with this. If they listen to this on their way to the office, they can experiment with it today. And I, I think the episodes like this that come out that are that practical, that are that easy to implement, have real value for the audience. So I thank you for that. And once again, as always, the number of times you've been on now and the number of times you're coming on in the future, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Always fun. Thank you very much, Will. 